Hello and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. And Joe will be on later in the show. This is a Frankenstein episode. Reason for that is Joe and I have not been able to meet up to record a show. He will explain why he hasn't been able to. And I will now explain why I haven't been able to. That's why we uh, have not had a new episode. Since Festivus, I did have a solo episode where I interviewed Tanya Kay, who is a dancer, performer, writer, director, actress, etc., etc. I've been a longtime fan of hers. I really thought that the interview came off well. And if you haven't listened to it yet, please go listen to it. But when last we spoke, it was Festivus. And I went to my friend Tommy's annual Festivus party, which was a lot of fun. And then the next day I was going to go visit my mother. She was um, she was supposed to go to Mayo's Clinic. She has uh, an issue that they were going to do some pre-work on. She was going to go there for the evaluation, get everything set, and then go back in February for a surgery. Well, the problem is that when she went in for them to do the examination and everything, they said that she was not healthy enough for the examination. And they actually admitted her. And then the, then, uh, so she was there over the weekend of Christmas. And then on Festivus, she actually collapsed. And had to be sent to the ICU. So the next day, the 24th, which was Christmas Eve, I worked my group home shift until noon, drove down, and was there for a week as she was recovering and dealing with the issues that were being going on there. My sister was there too. And again, remember, they had just planned to be there for three days. And this was, they had been there now a week. So I was there for a week. I came back. I had to cover a wrestling show that Saturday night. It was a pay-per-view, AEW's World End. And as I'm covering World's End, I start to not feel good. I just felt odd. I thought I had a, you know, and I ate something and thought, excuse me, thought, well, it must disagree with me. So I quit eating. And then I started to feel chills. So I took my temperature. Temperature was fine. And then by halfway through the show, I messaged the guys who run the Pro PW Insider website and said, I'm going to finish up covering the show, but I'm not going to be able to do the, the post game. I don't feel good. I have to wake up in the morning and work. When it's done, I'm just going to go to bed. And because I, you know, Hadn't been sick in a while, like since November, but I mean actually sick. I did a COVID test and man, I hate those things because you have to shove it way up in your nose and both sides and your eyes are watering and it's, ugh, but uh, came up negative. But after the pay-per-view was over, I just turned the TV off, sent the report, laid down, went to sleep. Woke up the next day. I had to be at work at 7 a.m. And because I felt bad, it's like, you know, maybe I've got strep throat. I've had my flu shot. Maybe it's the flu. Maybe it's just a particularly nasty cold, even though I'd had a cold back um, in October. And I would think that if you have a cold, you're not going to get another one for a while. But yeah, whatever. I wore a mask when I went to the gas station to get my soda. I wore a mask the whole time when I was at work. And that was New Year's Eve. I came home and I had all these plans for New Year's Eve. You know, it's like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to cook. I'm going to do this. But I felt miserable. I mean, I just felt miserable. So I just kind of laid, either sat or laid on the couch, watched football, um, didn't really make any snacks that I had planned to make, didn't make any of the food I planned to make. And I did play some video games. I played Power Wash Simulator which is how exciting I am. 
if you have an Xbox Xbox Live Gold, whatever it is, it's one of the free games, and basically it's okay. You have a power washer. You need to go and clean off this the car or this playground or you know whatever. And I like to call it a calm game because it's just you know there's something satisfying about it. It's very calm. I stayed up till around I don't know I'd say one or two in the morning playing the game, and then I just went to sleep. And the next day I woke up at 8, and I felt miserable, and I took some DayQuil, and I laid back down, and I had to work the group home from noon to 9. And I w did not know I would be the only staff there. No, it was from 2 to 9. I'm sorry, 2 to 9. I did not know I would be the only staff there. So I worked the group home, and again... I didn't feel good, so I wore a mask the whole time. And when I'm giving meds or stuff, I used hand sanitizer. Because if I've got the cold, I don't want to give it to them. So I do all that, and I the, the dinner had not been made. Nothing had been taken out and thought out. So it's like, okay, what can I throw together at the last minute? I threw something together at the last minute. One of the clients has to have their food chopped up. And it was like, I don't feel good at all. Rather than chop it up, I'm just going to use the, the, you know, basically the, the mechanical thing to chop it up. The other thing about that at the group home, I did not know I was working solo. And one of the pe and the person that I normally work with on, if I'm in on a Monday, is a college student. And if things are quiet, he's going to do his homework. And that's perfectly fine. So I thought he was in the staff room doing his homework and it wasn't until about four o'clock that I went in to say I don't feel real good can you take care of dinner I go in he's not there I look at the schedule and it's like okay that person's not here what's the deed oh they took the day off and we only have one staff so I made dinner and one of the clients who has their food chopped up didn't like the fact that I had used the, the machine to kind of grind it up a little bit so she threw a fit and I I literally said, I don't feel good. You don't want me handling your food or you will get sick as well. So you can throw a fit if you want, but I'd rather if you just ate because I don't feel good. And she started to throw a fit and saw just how horrible I looked. I actually looked in the mirror and it's like, oh, I look like death. I look like something de death brought with it in its suitcase. And she said, I'll have it for lunch tomorrow. Can I just have a peanut butter sandwich? Fine. I made a peanut butter sandwich. Um, they, they watch TV. I was zoning out the whole time. I was actually texting friends saying, I really feel miserable. I didn't realize I was working alone for the last three hours. And I made sure that I, because I felt bad, it's like, okay, I'm only going to think what's the very next thing I have to do rather than, oh, here's all the stuff I got to do all night. So it was okay. After dinner, what do I need to do? I need to get this client to bed and we have to use a lift machine to get her into bed because she can't, you know, she, she can't move herself. Boom, get her into bed, get her covered up. Okay, what's next? Next is medications. This person has medication. All right, I'm going to get their medication. Again, hand sanitizer. Wore the mask the whole time. Gave the meds. After the meds, it's like, okay, I need to clean up after supper. That took, normally I can get that done 10, 15 minutes. It took a little over a half hour because I just was so, just out of it and miserable and I'm all done and I sit down on the couch and the two clients who were still up very self-sufficient and around 8 30 they decided they were going to go to bed which was fine with me and they went to bed early because they'd stayed up the night before was New Year's Eve so they had stayed up with their family and come back during the day and when they go to bed I just kind of am laying there just not laying there, I'm sitting there, but I'm just kind of out of it until the nine o'clock staff comes in. I come home and I get home. And normally after I get home, it takes me a while to wind down. 
So I'll read a couple of comics or I'll watch something on TV or I'll play a video game or read a book or something. Nope, not this time. I got home. I locked the door and I just fell on the couch. And thank goodness I have the lights programmed to go off at 11 o'clock because I didn't even have the energy to tell the um, tell the lights to turn themselves off. So I had to work at the office job the next day. And I wanted, you know, I when, it, when you get some time off, because I had a week off, it was supposed to be to visit my parents in Illinois. Instead, I had spent the whole week at Mayo's Clinic with my mother sitting in the waiting room of the ICU. So I wanted to get up early so that I could, you know, get a shower, get all taken care of, have something healthy to eat. I bought healthy food. I was all set for the week. And instead, the alarm went off at 730 and it went off again at eight. And then at a quarter after eight, I finally dragged myself out of bed off the couch. I get a soda I make a hot tea. I put it in my my lovely um, Contigo uh, coffee mug, which will keep it warm for almost eight hours, which is amazing. And I sit at my desk, and it's like, I really don't feel good. I feel kind of dizzy. And it's the best way to describe it is I felt like I was not in complete control of myself that it wasn't that I was out of body. It was more that, oh yeah, that's my hand. And I would need to think, I need to take my hand and grab the mouse rather than just doing it automatically. I had to concentrate on doing that. And then at about 20 minutes into my shift, I said, you know, I should go to the bathroom. I really need to go to the bathroom. I got up and I remember being very dizzy and I remember falling. I passed out. And in passing out, I actually knocked over a box that I put comics in that I had just gotten from DCB service. So I wake up, I'm in the middle of the living room floor, comics all around me, confused as hell because I had passed out. And I look at the clock and I may have been out for like one or two minutes. I have the, I have the, uh, the, the peace of mind to go to my work computer and type in, I just passed out. I need to go to the ER. I probably will not be working my hours today. Send it to my supervisor. I didn't log out, which I found out later. I didn't log out. I just sent it and made sure that I yeah, logged out time card wise, but I didn't log out of the system. And I go to the bathroom <clears throat> and I come back and I, you know, I've been through first aid training, et cetera, et cetera. When you pass out, first thing you do when somebody passes out is you call 911. I don't want to have to pay for an ambulance. So I got in the car and I drove to the urgent care slash emergency room, which is only about two miles away, which I now know was a stupid idea, but your brain does not work quite right. I live alone and I was thinking, I don't want to have to pay for an ambulance when it's just two miles away. Then how will I get home? Smartly. The night before, I had left my go bag in the car because I had taken it to the group home. <laughs> Monday night, I got home. I left everything in the car. I didn't bring in my go bag. I didn't bring in my bag with my medication and stuff. The only thing I brought in was my cell phone and my tablet. So I go to the ER and I tell them. And I, of course, had a mask on. Because, hey, maybe I'm sick. Maybe I'm contagious. I get there and they say, what brings you here? And I said, well, I drove here. I just passed out. I feel really horrible, coughing, sore throat. I don't have a fever, but I don't know what's wrong. So they take me in. They do all these tests. They lay me down. I thankfully had my tablet, my phone, and my uh, Kindle. So 
I'm messaging. I actually sent a message to the group home saying, I'm scheduled tonight, but I don't think I'll be there because I passed out. I'm currently in the ER. They're like, oh my gosh, you worked yesterday. Yes, but I wore a mask the whole time, etc., etc. About an hour later, the nurses come in. They go, you have COVID and your blood pressure is really low. You're dehydrated. We're going to you know, give you an IV, etc., etc. I found out that when I got in, they took my blood pressure. It was 90 over 50, which means it was probably lower than that when I passed out, which is why I passed out. They pumped me full of saline, which got me fine. The other thing they did, they did a CAT scan. Because I passed out, they wanted to make sure I didn't have a concussion. Because they said, did you hit your head when you fall? And I said, I don't know. I wasn't awake. Thankfully, I was there for about three hours. They discharged me. They gave me the antivirals. They gave me this um, doctor's excuse, basically, that said, you can't work for a week. And I went home and you would think, oh, wow, I get a week off. But Monday, I'm sorry, that was on a Tuesday. I slept most of the time when I got home. Wednesday slept most of the time when I got home. Thursday was kind of able to stay awake a little more. But the coughing, the sore throat and everything was gone by Thursday. Then Friday, I was able to stay awake most of the day. So I watched TV and I read all sorts of stuff. Man, did I read a lot of stuff. I read four novels already this year. Comic-wise, I've read two omnibuses. The omnibus I read while I had COVID was The Infinity with all of the tie-in crossovers, which is the Thanos story that's in the middle of Jonathan Hickman's Avengers run. And at the time, it felt like a diversion from the main story he was doing about the um, universes collapsing into each other. But when you read it kind of on its own, it is this wonderful two-track story of there's this big galactic mess going on. And the Avengers are called away to that. And Thanos sees that as a chance to invade Earth. So you've got this two-track story going, and Hickman writes all of the Infinity and Avengers stuff, and one of the things that I love about Hickman is how he designs a story. It is beautifully plotted. Thanos is the scariest he's been since, I would say, back in the 70s. Thanos came off as scary. Um, the Avengers dealing with this galactic invasion type thing was great because most of the other major races in the Marvel Universe are like they fought the Avengers and now they need their help. So it wasn't a, okay, everything's forgiven. It was more yeah, um, we're sick of Earth. We're, we're sick of Earth and we're sick of you, but we need your help. And we don't like you. We don't like dealing with you. I Hickman understands the characters, their interactions. One of the problems I have with Hickman is that he is so focused on the meta, he has trouble with the micro. But in this, the character stuff was so well done, I didn't mind. Um, I also got completely caught up. I read all of the Saladin Ahmed, uh, Miles Morales, Ultimate Spider-Man stuff. His run was so good. The reason I like Ultimate Spider-Man so much is he's a teenager. So while it reminds me a lot of the early Peter Parker stuff by Lee and Ditko, it lasts longer because he's been in high school much longer than Peter Parker was. They, His family knows he's Spider-Man. They have set up a really cool supporting cast i just i don't mind that there are two spider-men because they're such different characters and the, the miles morales spider-man i like teenage superheroes because you have the inherent drama of a teenager and for me as an older person it's very nostalgic 
And I still think that when I was a teenager, yeah, I love Spider-Man and I love this character and I love that character, but I like Nova a lot. Why? Because he was my age. I like the Human Torch a lot. Why? Because he was a teenager. Um, I like Spider-Man. He was a college student. You need, you need the grown-up superheroes, you know, like Reed Richards and Ben Grimm and everything. But you've got to have characters that your younger audience could say, oh, they're a lot like me. But I was out again for a week. So really, after Christmas, I had two weeks off. And neither one of them were actually vacations. Because one of them, I was at Mayo's at my mother's side, very worried about her as she continues to get better. It looks like that she may be going home on the 27th. So that will mean she has been there for over a month. Hopefully she's going to continue to improve so that she can go home on the 27th. Everyone in the family has their fingers crossed. I'm not a religious person, but there are a lot of people praying for her as well. But that was not a vacation because you're, most of the time I was in the waiting room. I remember I was in the waiting room pretty much all day Christmas. I would be able to go in and see her for an hour or two at a time. I was not cognizant enough to watch football, but I did switch the TV in the waiting room to football because people were coming in and out. No one stayed there all day like I did and my sister did. They would come in for an hour or so because they were going to visit a relative or the doctors or the other people would come in on their break and eat their lunch there and they would have the Christmas football games. But if there wasn't a football game for somebody to watch, I basically would put it on the, the soothing, calming, relaxing music and I would read. And then the week after that, the week after New Year's, I had COVID. So I was just in a, in a sleep coma. I still am much more tired than I was before. The actual hard part of COVID, I got through pretty quickly. You know, what, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday by Wednesday. I no longer had the sore throat and all that. But I still am sleeping more than I have in the past. And then Saturday, um, Saturday and Sunday were actually days where I felt good enough that I actually enjoyed it. So I was off for two weeks, but I really only had a vacation for a weekend. I'm now back at the office job. Um, and then Joe has been out of town. There are times when we're going to record, but he is dealing with something that he talks about later, or I am driving down to visit my mother whenever I can. So regular episodes resume next week. We have previews episode. It's already recorded. It's being edited. It will be out on Monday. And we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that we're back on Mondays. Other, other stuff that I would recommend. I went through a flurry of books from Hard Case Crime. Um... I was borrowing them from the library electronically. <laughs> and the ones that I am recommending, because they were so good and so much fun and just great crime novels. Later, by Stephen King. Stephen King has done three books for Hard Case Crime. Joyland, um, Haven. Is it Haven? Is that the name of it? No, it's the Colorado Kid. Colorado Kid, which was the basis for Haven. Uh, Colorado Kid, I hated the ending. Um, Joyland, I absolutely loved. And then this new one, which came out, I say new, it came out three years ago. Um, later, it's about a young man who is able to talk to people for a while after they die. And there is a crime story involved because it's hard case crime and that's what they do. I have been reading Stephen King pretty much since Jim Starlin had Ben Grimm reading Salem's Lot in Marvel 2 and 1 Annual Number 2 in 1977. His stuff for Hard Case Crime is some of his best stuff. It's very lean. It's very tight. It's very clear he has an editor who holds him to task. And I think that that is very important for writers to have someone outside who's 
basically says, you don't need that. You don't need that. Trim that down. You're basically stripping the story down to the bare essentials. And I really enjoyed it for that reason. The next book that I read was Quarry's Blood by Max Allen Collins. Quarry is his hitman character that he has done a whole bunch of novels on. I think that they're up to 16. Uh, Max Allen Collins was a person who got me into reading crime fiction. Before that, I'd read horror, science fiction, and fantasy, and I read the comic Ms. Tree, which I did not realize was a pun until much later, because I'm not that bright. And Quarry's Blood takes place after the last Quarry, which was supposed to be the last novel, but he came up with an idea for something that happens after that. Really good crime novel. I liked it a lot. I read Tough Tender. No, that not Tough Tender. Sorry, I apologize for that. I read... There it is. Too Many Bullets by Max Allen Collins, which is his Nate Heller character, which is a private detective who interacts with real characters. This one was about the Robert F. Kennedy assassination. Again, Max Allen Collins, one of my favorite writers, excellent book. You can believe it or not, but it basically is purporting to tell the true story of what happened with RFK's assassination based on um, all the stuff that people have researched and everything. Of course, he puts a fictional character into it, but even with the fictional character into it, he uses real characters, real events, etc., etc. I read two books from Scott Van Dorick, who is a new writer, and I think the only thing he has done so far has been for Hard Case Crime. I'm going to double check that real quick. Scott Van Dorick. Let's see if he's written any other books. He's written um, a book on Stephen King movies. He's written a book on Redneck Cinema. But his only two fiction books, I've read both of them in the last month. First one is Charles Gate Confidential, which is a really ambitious story about an art theft... And it's told at the time of the art theft, which is the 1940s. A story in the 80s about that same building that has now become a college dorm. And one of the people involved in the art theft becomes involved with somebody who lives in the dorm. And then current, which is the aftermath of all those things, putting all the pieces together. And doing a story, doing a story set in different time periods is hard. Doing a story set in time different time periods where you have this chapter in this time period, the next chapters in the next time period, the next chapters in the next time period, boom, 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 one, two, three for the entire book is incredibly hard, but he's able to pull it off. The other book he did is Low Down Road, which is just a straight crime story where um some people steal a bunch of drugs and they're going to drive up to Evil Knievel jumping the Snake River Canyon to sell them to all the bikers there. And everybody involved, it's almost a chase. It is a chase novel. It is so fun and so well put together. I absolutely loved Lodan Road. Charles Gate Confidential was good. I won't say that I absolutely loved it, but I did really like it. And then I think, did I read any others from them? I'm just looking here. Nope, that was the last one. That was the last one. Uh, their book's coming out later this year, Nobody's Angel by Jack Clark. Then Death Comes Too Late by Charles Ar Ardai. He is the... Basically, he's the editor at Hard Case Crime, and it's a bunch of his short stories. And then the last book coming out this year that they've announced so far is Into the Night by Cornell Woodrich, the guy who wrote the book Rear Window. 
comic-wise, I already told you that I've read, um, I read Infinity, I read Saladin Ahmed's um, run on Ultimate Spider-Man. I have in my hand a book that I'm reading that I'll talk more about next episode because we already recorded the next episode. The Normal Man Omnibus. Normal Man was a 12-issue miniseries done in the 80s by Valentino. Kind of a parody of all comics, but the gist of the story is that it's a world filled with superheroes and there is one person, Normal Man, who has no powers. Rocketed into space by his junior CPA father, who was convinced his home world was going to explode. He didn't. He landed on the planet Levram, read it backwards, where everyone except him had at least one superpower. He became the world's only normal man. Really good book. I loved it when I read it back in the 80s. I loved it when they put out a trade paper back in the 90s of the mini series. This is everything, all of the normal man appearances that have been done anywhere. And then the last book that I have here that I will probably be reading over the weekend is Fafford and the Grey Mouser Omnibus, which is the Fritz Lieber fantasy characters that have been adapted by both Marvel and DC. And Dark Horse has put out a book putting the uh, Marvel miniseries and the series from DC in one book. Oddly enough, Howard Chaikin was involved in all of them. He drew the DC book and he wrote the Marvel book, which was drawn by Mike Mignola. So, and now we'll get into what Joe's been up to. Hey gang, Crazy Joe Ryder here. We're doing the best we can. We've had issues. We haven't been able to get together to podcast since that, uh, what was left of the Festivus episode. I haven't even listened to that. But we do want to get you caught up because it's 2024. For those of you just joining us for the first time, thank you. For those of you who have been our listening for a long time, welcome back. What we're doing is a kind of a piecemeal episode because we just couldn't quite get our schedules to jibe and you know, Corey's got things he'll talk about as well. And of course, I want to talk about what we've been doing these last couple of weeks since the Festivus episode. A couple good things health-wise. First off, I have been able to find a therapist. I know I've been freaking about it. And believe me, it has helped a bit just to be able to talk to a guy who's not necessarily in my corner like you would when you talk to a friend or, or even talking to my wife. But it is a, it is something I recommend. Corey talked about it. Our good buddy Turbo talked about it, and it was so tough to get in to finally see somebody. It was just a relief. And again, it's something I urge everybody to do. And Corey would advocate even if you don't need a therapist, you don't have issues, it's still nice to go in and talk to someone. The other thing is, I recovered from about a shingles. That was actually not, not good to have shingles. The last bout I had was uh, over 10 years ago. I might have talked about it at an early podcast. Hell, we'll get, Corey and I got the Joe prizes ready to ship out. If anybody wants to tell us if I've talked about shingles in a previous episode, it'd be about 10 years ago because that's how long it was. I just remember because when I got it, I wasn't able to get the shingle shot because I wasn't 50. Since then, I have. And the good thing about it, if you can call it a good thing, is I had gone into work that day and a colleague of mine looked at me and said, oh, what's wrong? So what are you talking about? You got spots all over your face. And I'm like, what? So excuse myself, went in the restroom and I'll be damned from leaving the house to getting there. I had those spots on my face and I also had had an itchy patch on my back that was bugging me. Because she noticed I was able to call in and get in to see the doctor the same day. Most of the time it takes a week or so before I can get in to see a doctor. By that time you got full-blown shingles. Because they caught it within 72 hours, they gave me that same antiviral stuff they give you for shingles, not shingles, uh, COVID. I, I don't know if Corey was on it or not, but it helps prevent the spread of the virus. And that way 
I was able to tamp down and within half a week, I was able to get the shingles under control where I could go back to work. Because more importantly, is I had a trip scheduled over Christmas to go to Reno. My eldest daughter, Dana, is studying out there. She's finishing up her grad work. She'll be graduating in May. By the time this year podcast drops, she'll have already either turned in her thesis or she'll be working on it. I'm a little fuzzy for the grad school stuff, but she's well on her way doing, getting it all taken care of. So we had this whole trip planned to Reno, and because the shingles was taken care of before I left, no problem. I was able to take off and do it. One thing that was interesting, we went through Minneapolis Airport, obviously. We had flew Delta, go to Salt Lake City, to Reno. And it worked out real well. If you ever do get through the Minneapolis airport, check out the Prince store there. It's in the main concourse, sort of between the footprint of where the F concourse starts and the G concourse is. Just a fascinating place to visit, especially if you're a Prince fan. Oh, sure, you can go to Paisley Park if you're in town. But they actually had handwritten lyrics on display. They were handwritten for the sign at the Times album, released in 1987, and Prince's own handwriting. I absolutely love stuff like that. So, anyways, we got to Reno, no problem. Flight was great. Delta was fantastic. TSA was quick and easy. Reno's a beautiful place. A little hazy. Weather was 40, 50, which was nice. And I could talk a lot about what we did in Reno, a lot of drinking, a lot of eating. But of course, you guys just want to hear about the comic stores I checked out. Now, I got to tell you, they're pretty much the same shops that we visited the last time I was in Reno. Again, a Joe Prize for anybody who wants to pick that one up. Hint, two years ago. So first, I want to say we stayed at the Pepper Mill Resort Spa and Casino, which was beautiful. The only real complaint we have is that Chris and I are non-smokers, so anytime we were down in the casino area or going to the restaurants or one of the bars, always a little bit of smoke. So that kind of, it, it's just something you got to deal with if you're going to be going to these places. I won an entire quarter off video poker. Chris, my lovely wife, won about 400 bucks. I guess I know where I raid at the Peppermill Resort Spa and Casino. Oh, by the way, we didn't actually, we, we did report that on our tax. You know, so never mind, never mind. The first place we went to, a place we've been to before, Uncle Junkie, which is a clothing exchange. They've actually split into two shops. The first one we stopped at was downtown, 101 North Virginia Street in Reno. And that was the one. That was amazing. In the back, just tons of comics, tons of things to see. Some of the things, like I found a Deep Throat original classic, if, if you're so inclined, if, if that's the way you roll. A couple very interesting Godzilla monsters. Guy has a beautiful run of the EC comics. The hardcover ones that Corey loves. If you, if you want, give him a call. You can probably get them. They had some of the... Uh, Galatina, Surira, the, the, these are figures that I used to sell in my shop that were imported from Japan. Kind of adult-minded figures, and it was kind of neat to see them again. I saw a poster for Doomed, autographed by the director. Doomed was the untold story of the Roger Corman's Fantastic Four. And then somebody also had a Han Solo DL-44 Heavy Blaster, an actual metal replica weapon and it was just fun to see what i bought was some comics of course and let's see if i can find it it was a snake pliskin comic that had been autographed by kurt russell and i'm just trying to yeah here it is john carpenter snake pliskin chronicles number one signed by actor kurt russell as a retailer incentive you know me, I love my signed comics. I just, I had to pick it up. And he, this guy in the back, whoever it is, and somewhere I have his card in that, he has tons of signed things. Usagi, Yamoto, sketchbooks, 
covers that have been sketched and personalized, I easily could have dropped thousands of dollars there. And I just curtailed myself, not so much because I wanted to, because anything I bought, I had to figure out how to get it home, which is why I didn't end up buying all those EC sets. Again, that was Uncle Junkie's downtown location. Definitely worth a, a stop. The second place we went was Coffee and Comics. This is the one that I've talked about before. They actually have two locations. The one we went to was at the corner of Mona and Lakeside in Reno, Nevada. I believe it was 904 West Moana, M-O-A-N-A. -A. We stopped there before. A cool layout, beautiful place. Sit down, have some coffee. The comics they had, guys, you could probably use to reprice them. I wasn't in a digging mode yet. But they were fun to look through. I didn't buy anything there, but we did, like we said, we took a break. We had some coffee. It's just a fantastic location. And again, they have a second location somewhere. I was looking on their site. I'm not sure where it is, but uh, you can always Google it because that's not the one I went to. The second one I went to, I'm sorry, the third one I went to was Comic Kingdom. That's located on 595 East Moana Lane in Nevada. This is a real comic store, okay? New comics, old comics, it's a digger store. I didn't have a lot of time to dig, mostly because my wife didn't want to really go into the comic store. The kids did with me, my, my daughter and her, her boyfriend. I looked around and... Again, tons of things I could have bought. What I did buy, they must have known I was coming because they had a whole pile of $5 signed comic books. And I picked up, it's just looking at a few of them, that Ashcan Editions for some small press stuff, Major Damage and IO. There's a Megaton number one. There's an Archer and Armstrong signed by Jim Shooter from the old Triumph line. Scavengers number one, limited edition signed. There was a Megalith, which was the Continuity Comics, signed by Neil Adams and somebody else signed it. I can't, I can't read it here. This is one of those things like, how in hell's bells did it get there? But the Heroes Reborn, the Heroes Return cover that the Comic Zone had. This was signed by Dave Derviris. Comic Zone was an old shop that used to exist over in the Richfield area, very close to Hot Comics Richfield. And I think this is the comic that might have sunk them because the worst part was is it was a comic exclusive. So God knows how many of these things they bought. However, when they did the ad in The Wizard, the phone number was wrong. And so who knows how many people called and wasn't able to get through or get orders. I know for my shop, I ended up buying 10 and stuff. So there were many more. I pretty much bought almost everything he had because I was like, dude, you must have known I was coming. Comic Kingdom is a fantastic store. When I return to Reno in May, I want to visit all the shops again, especially Comic Kingdom, because I do want to spend some time digging through stuff. The final place we visited was the Junkies in Reno's Public Market. Again, another, Reno's Public Market's a big open area, a lot of stores to eat, Junkies in the back, not as many comics there, but more fun things to look at. And we, we all picked up some stuff, which was kind of cool. Sadly, the one place I could not visit, Omega Frog Comics, is temporarily closed. The last time I was in Reno a couple years ago, they were closed because of a family illness. I might have been COVID, might not. This time it looks like, from what I heard, they lost their lease and they're looking to reopen. So it's two times I tried to get to Omega Frog Comics, they weren't open. Keep our fingers crossed. Maybe they'll be open in May because looking in, it looked like a fun store. I just wasn't able to visit. Now, as we went through, the next day, we decided let's visit some bookstores because, you know, I like books. The first place we went was a place called Sundance Books, 121 California Avenue in Reno. And what it is is I've got this all done, but I'm trying to click forward to the pictures 
that I took because this was basically looks like they took an old house and they every room is different with different types of books and music and things like that. I picked up a book called America's Loneliest Roads, Highway 50 in the Lincoln Highway in Nevada. And it was signed and autographed by Stephen Provost. So you take this stairs up, they had sculptures. Each room was a little different in terms of theme. Tons of books to look at. Some of the cool ideas I like, they had a place called Go on a blind date with a book. For a $3 cash donation that benefited literacy, you could pick up a book. They had brown paper wrapped it, and then each book had the first sentence of the book in it. First one was, it was Benny's 10th birthday. Another one, hello, it is I, your grandson. Insert name here, said Dini. Let's see. Sila DiPinko woke up thirsty in the ice cold bed. What a brilliant idea. I I just love this idea. If I ever do win the lottery or break down and do another comic store bookstore, this would be a great idea. Have some fun with some older books and gives you a chance to do something for a worthy cause. They had a lot of cool albums there, a lot of CDs. It was just a fun place to visit. The second place we went to, if you excuse me while I get caught up here, a place called The Radical Cat, 1717 South Wells Avenue in Reno. This is more of a progressive bookstore. If you're wondering why they call it The Progressive Cat, they have an area in the back where the cats are. And there was one cat who came out and you have to ask to go in the area because cats don't roam all over the bookstore. They just roam in this area and back. And what a brilliant idea. Again, a progressive bookstore. I saw another book by that Stephen Provost, Sarah, 395 Highway. I autograph. I didn't pick that one up. There were a number of other books. Some of them were people that Dana knew from the college. Like we picked up a book called Little Furry. Stories by Casey Bell, and I'm sorry, I actually took the, they had a really nice display with, you know, explaining her and about this book, but it's too small and I, I can't read it. But I got the book, so eventually I'll probably read it. A lot of graphic novels and other th books like that there. It's mostly, like I said, a progressive bookstore, so we picked up a few books. It was a lot of fun. The last place we went was Grassroots Books. Now this is on 660 East Grove Street in Reno. This is more like a warehouse bookstore. You go in, they have new books, but they also had a $1 price book sale going on in the back where I picked up a couple books. And on the inside, oh, so many books, so much, such great discounts. I had to really, really hold myself back because I just didn't have the space to bring all this stuff home. But these are places definitely worth visiting. And other than a Barnes & Noble, which we passed by on the way to another restaurant, it's pretty much the, the big places we stopped at in Reno. And we did go up to Truckee. California, so straight up Highway 80. The You can look at it on the map. Beautiful. Little small town. A lot of fun. It's a historic place. One of those places I'd love to visit. They had trains going through. I like trains. Saw an Amtrak train. Saw a couple other trains. Very close to the Donner Pass. If you guys don't know who the Donners were, grab yourself some chi chicken fingers and read about the tragedy of the Donner Party trying to get through the Sierra Mountains. I say tragedy because even as we speak, there was a snowstorm, I probably cleared out now, that closed the highway we would have driven on, I-80, because of spinouts and, and things like that. This is the Sierra Mountains. They get a lot of snow up there. Matter of fact, when the snowstorm rumbled over the mountains, parts of Reno lost power. Dana said they didn't, but I was just a little worried there. I heard there's a tornado near Reno. Is that anywhere where you are? 
the one bookstore there, word after word books, was closed. Ah, the holiday hours, the one day a week, Thursday. I mean, we went between Christmas and New Year's. So there were a lot of people there. And even some of the people we were with were like, why are all these people here? It's like, why are all the kids here? It's like, well, it is the holiday season. So, of course, a lot of families would be out visiting. And Truckee is a beautiful place to visit. Reno was a lot of fun. I say that about the kids because we went downtown to Circus Circus, which, again, casino hotel. Circus Circus inside is a lot of flashy games, video games. Dana is trying to win a pickleball set. It's one of those places where, like, it probably you could go out and buy a pickleball set for less, but it's more fun to play skeet ball or, or press the cart and or basketball shoots or whatever. We actually played a superpower game for DC superpowers where you, you drop the coins and coins drop and then certain ones and they will drop and they keep pushing, pushing, and then you can get some cards and things like that. And we played until we actually got some cards. I got one of them. It's a Batman superhero series three. It feels like a phone card. But I think what it is is you, you buy the set and then you turn them in to get extra points. Dana doesn't really want to play that game. Well, we played it. Played a lot of ski ball. Got her about a thousand points toward her pickleball set. So that was a lot of fun. But again, not as much smoke, but it was very crowded because of the kids. They actually had a floor show going on. It was just a lot of fun. And of course, we went out to dinner at a place called Roxy Steak and Seafood. And we spent about 500 bucks. Not the best steak I've ever had. Again, it's four people with drinks. But probably number three on the list. And for that type of price, yeah, it better be. It was a wonderful time heading out to Reno. I loved it. I, I got Reno on the brain. I could easily move out there. One thing I will say, it's interesting. When we got our rental car, we got ourselves a Ford F-150. And it was white. Why do I say that? Well, apparently Reno loves white Fords because everywhere we went, we kept running into white Fords. No kidding. There was one place we stopped and counting the white pickup I was in, there were literally about five Fords around us and I think about seven more white pickup Fords, or just white pickups, different brands and stuff. So you're talking like 10 white pickups. It's like we were part of a cult. And the best thing is because Reno's, Renites, if you want to call them that, they drive kind of precariously, which is why when it does snow or ice there, people end up in the ditch a lot. But I had a, even though I had South Dakota plates, I had a white truck. I could drive like a Renite. And the people kept out of my way. Uh, one thing that was weird when I got home, I sat down and in my cop car, I, I'm sitting lower than I was sitting in the pickup. I'm not sure I like that. So I may want to go back. On the way back, the last place we stopped was Jelly Donuts Coin Laundry. Two separate businesses, open 24-7, but what a brilliant model. You can go over, get a jelly donut, spill it on yourself, go next door and clean it. So a lot of fun. That's pretty much what I've been doing. I'm back to work. Corey, back to you. Freaking and geeking. I am not going to do a lot with freaking and geeking because basically the first part of what I told you I've been up to is what I've been freaking about. I have not read any news about comics. I have not read any news about um, stuff outside of the different crises I've been dealing with. Uh, so my freaking is going to be... I would... I looked at what I've been dealing with since early November. And actually, if you want to go a little before that, my mother was diagnosed with the issue she has in October. Then I got sick in November. Then my sister passed away um, the day after Christmas. Then um, my mother goes to Mayo's and is there. It's now been a month. And then I'm sick. I get COVID 
and work has been very stressful with a couple of problems, one of which I created and one of which they created, that really ramped my anxiety up to enormous levels. And I think part of it is that there's all this other stuff that's going on. So anything else that sort of rocks the apple cart is going to make my anxiety go through the roof. Um, I have not had time for a therapy appointment. Joe talks about how he started therapy. I haven't had time for a therapy appointment. I don't have time for one until February when I'm going to be getting back on that wagon. So um, my freaking is that I'm super stressed and I would just like a few months where there's no new crises happening. Geeking. I have been using the digital library loan for the past three weeks when I'm visiting my mother or when I'm in the waiting room so that if I read a book, I could just go on my phone, return it, get another book. And it pops up on my Kindle. I don't want to be carrying around a bunch of books and omnibuses and everything when I go down to when I go to the group home or when I go down to visit my mother. But when, you know, you, when you know somebody who's in the hospital, you spend a lot of time just waiting. And I spend my waiting time reading. So digital library loans have been amazing. Reading comics on my Kindle has been amazing. Uh, I'm sorry, on my tablet has been amazing. I have, Comixology, which used to be what they had with Amazon, is gone. But you can still access them through Kindle. So I will use the Kindle app on my tablet for a lot of the digital comics I have purchased. I purchased, back a while back, they had a Masterworks sale where they were selling off Masterworks for $1.99 and $3.99. And I went nuts buying all of them. And I'm so glad I did because now it's like I have pretty much all the Atlas um, digital stuff. I have a whole bunch of other masterworks digitally. And while I think the price for a masterwork has gone insane because pretty much a, a omnibus is like three masterworks in one. And a masterwork is 75 to 90 to $100. An omnibus is 100 to $150. Sorry, I'm going to get the omnibus. It's bigger. It has everything from the Masterworks and stuff, basically stuff they didn't have when they put the Masterworks together. But the fact that I have access to all this stuff digitally has been amazing. It's helped me like you can't believe. It's also been a source of comfort in that you're in a hotel room dealing with a lot of stressful stuff. I read before I go to bed. It's really nice to just lay down, open up my tablet. I'm going to read some comics. Just get me some entertainment that takes my mind off everything that's going on. And that's really what I've been geeking on. You've been listening to Joe and I blather on about funny books for about an hour and, I don't know, an hour and 10, hour and 15 minutes. And as we say every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you like the most. I want to thank you for having patience with us as we're going through this rough time. I promise that we will have more episodes and they will come out on a regular basis. Joe and I are going to be putting together some fill-in episodes for when this sort of thing happens. And we hope this th sort of thing doesn't happen anymore. I hope you had a wonderful holiday and that you're not dealing with as much bullshit as I am. Freaking. I I've really only got a couple things I'm freaking on. The first thing is, it's that time of year again. Or government shutdown. They're starting to talk about it. Yeah, there's some good news, bad news, but until it's passed, it's it's weird because they've got to do it twice. They did like half the government that shuts down probably within a week of this podcast dropping if they don't approve a budget. And then because I'm part of the Homeland Security, they approved us through like February 2nd or something. So just like I was freaking on back in 
was it October, November? I forget what it was. It's it blurs. It's a same old song and dance. Maybe shut down. Who knows? And the other thing that I'm kind of freaking on, and I think, well, by the time we record our next podcast, it'll be a couple days away, but my wife's going in for surgery next week to de deviate her septum because she's been having problems with it. And she was going to do it a couple months ago, but caught the vid. And now we're very carefully wearing our mask and making sure we're not around anybody to, you know, catch anything. Cause I, last thing I need is a cold and I've gotten all my shots and everything, but you know, I said back to you, Corey, what are you freaking on? Kicking? Geeking on a couple things, you know, I'm buzzing away on my eBay, and since I'm not planning on doing a con anytime soon, I am still ready to make deals and do stuff. I've been putting on lots of stuff. You guys can have the front door, go to Crazy Comics, and stuff on my Facebook page, or just go to eBay, look for Crazy, Corey will put the link somewhere in the broadcast. Check it out. If you see something you like, even if I haven't put best offer on it, because you're a valued listener to the podcast, I will probably cut you a deal on it. More importantly, with the government shuts down, I need to be selling this crap. I'll be going to work. I just won't get paid for it until they do pass the budget. So another thing that there's a couple new stores that have popped up. And by the time well, the first one is called Bricks and Minifigs in Roseville. This is a Lego type store where they have lots of things. And I went by it today and they're actually open. They're not doing their grand opening till February 2nd, but they're kind of doing what I guess would be a soft open. So I may go visit and check it out. Maybe get an interview with these guys, but they're located on 1688 Lexington Avenue North in well, it says St. Paul, but actually on the Roseville side of things. And then, of course, a block over in the same shopping mall side is Mr. Zero's, which is a fantastic secondhand shop place to check out. Another place that's opening up, Mint in the Box Toys. Now, I've got to find my phone because I don't think... They're actually on eBay, too, under uh, Tester Toys. But they're opening up a store in... Shoreview, I'm sorry, Stillwater, and their address is going to be 16, I'm sorry, 1465 Frontage Road West in Stillwater. Their hours are going to be Tuesday through Saturday, which sucks because I'm off Monday usually, and their grand opening will have dropped by the time this podcast hits, though a grand opening will be the 12th of January, and of course... I can't get there till the following Tuesday. So all you guys are going to get the, you got three days to get the good stuff before I head out there. So that's kind of exciting. Uh, they've been talking for months about this, you know, saying we've been stocking toys for ages and they've been on Facebook. You can find under mint in the box toys. So a lot of exciting stuff going there. And that's pretty much all I'm geeking on. Other than the fact that thank you to Corey for putting this piecemeal together. And we'll probably be back next week with Preview Show. Or not, you know, there's always something to screw it up.